You're tuned in to the Elevator Radio Show, a weekly program dedicated to covering news and information on elevators, escalators, and moving walkways. Produced in the wee hours of the morning, a new show is uploaded every Wednesday, sometimes even before you get out of bed. Listen to some of the comments sent in from our audience. Rob from New York writes, Tom, are you f***ing insane? You actually get up at 2 a.m. each Wednesday to put this show out? Man, you must love elevators. Tim from Illinois writes, I'm not sure why I listen, but ever since I tuned into the first show back in 2007, I've been addicted. Matt in Texas writes, I like your safety messages, Tom. It's important to remember them each and every day. And he also adds, When am I going to win the monthly prize pack giveaway? Ron from California sent this in. Despite your inability to pronounce words in the English language, I tune in each week and am glad that you offer this service to the industry. It's better than Google News Alerts. Sarah from Washington writes, Love the show, Tom, and look forward to it each week. I'm glad I signed up for the newsletter. You provide a valuable resource for the industry, not only for North America, but worldwide. Enjoy the show. And now, here's your sleep-deprived host, Tom Seibert. Hello. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whenever you are listening to the program. Thanks for tuning in today. It is uh, my pleasure to be here this bright and early in the morning. It's uh, about 4.35, been up since 2 o'clock, and uh, kind of had a reality check yesterday as I realized it was Monday, and I'm like, it was Tuesday, thought it was Monday, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I got to get in there and uh, do the show tomorrow. So again, it's one of those nights where, and one of those days where I just feel like I'm in a continuous cycle of this uh, Groundhog Day, where every day is kind of the same thing, kind of waiting and thinking and trying to do the best that uh, I can for those that are around me and those that are, you know, family. And it's just, it's it's getting tough. It's, uh, you know, honestly, it's just kind of wearing on me. It's, I'm sure it's wearing on everybody out there as well. And um, I truly wish there was a uh, just a, a little more common sense as, uh, you know, we, we move forward with this whole thing. Hope everybody had a good three-day weekend. Memorial Day, weather-wise, here in the Midwest was uh, partially wet, not Memorial Day necessarily, but it's Saturday and Sunday. But Memorial Day, uh, Sunday and Monday, weather was beautiful. Uh, temperatures were in the 80s, felt good to be out. Uh, Saturday night we had some torrential rainstorms where I was in my street trying to unclog gutters, or not gutters, but the grates in the street. And the water was up to my knees. Thank goodness nobody suffered any water in their basements. But it was at that moment, 8.30, 9 o'clock at night, when all of our neighbors came out to congregate, look at the street that was flooded, hadn't been flooded probably since 2001, like that. And uh, for once, this is the first time that none of us thought about the pandemic at all. It was like, wow. We had people next to each other taking photos. It was... It was pretty. It was pretty neat. It was. It was amazing to, to imagine the day when we are not all wrapped up in this how we are right now. Um, so I'm looking forward to that day. I really am. I want to get. I want to get through this. I want to get back on track. And uh, uh, this week's news stories, as they relate to elevators, were very in line with you know opening up with the pandemic, with viruses, with concerns regarding elevators in buildings as they open, uh, along with other areas of the office space where people are supposed to go back to work. Um, some companies have opted to just put into effect work at home, uh, um, uh, not mandates, I shouldn't say, but but eliminating the office completely. And instead, like I said, uh, putting into policy, I guess it's a more of a policy, working from home instead. So that just gives them more time to figure out how, how to go back to an office that's safe and how to reconfigure and do that. And, and so maybe that will be the driving force in our economy. We will, we will find out. One of the questions that was asked to me on Monday, I, it was pretty cool Monday. Our, uh, one of my neighbors is a, is a Navy. Um, he's not even a vet. He's still in the Navy, actually. Might be the reserve, but he came out in his whites on Monday. Unfortunately, he was not able to march in the local parade that he always is in with the VFW, and it's really unfortunate that um, on such an important day, we weren't able to do that as a country in most areas. I hope, hopefully somewhere we did it. So he came out, and it was very moving because he was in his, his, his whites, his officer of Navy whites came out, and the whole cul-de-sac came out to um, give him a you know round of applause. He got to take photographs with uh, two of our the little kids in the neighborhood, which was awesome. 
so it was it was a special time just to recognize him and all he had done for for our country and then also remember those that we've lost and that was the most important thing about memorial day had the flag flying out there it was just very patriotic and and very cool during that get together one of my uh, uh, a friend of mine asked the question we were just talking about some of our state officials here and I said something like uh, was not favorable and of, of how I thought some of it was being handled. And for the first time, I was asked, like, just right to my face, if you think that's, you know, that person or those people are doing such a bad job, what would you do differently? And, I, and, and it kind of caught me off guard. And it, it wasn't it wasn't asked to me in a different like in a mean way, like, you know, you're a, in a pol- political way. Well, it kind of was in a political way, but at the same time, it was asked to me in a way that what would you have done different? And I, and it was at that moment that I realized that I spend so much time or I feel like I spend a lot of time being angry at some of the decisions our state politicians are making with, um, with what appears to be not a whole lot of regard to the overall picture. I should say, and I'm trying to be as politically correct as possible, and you know nobody has to see this the same light as is 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 how I see it, and that's fine. But caught me off guard, and I thought for a split moment, I'm like, well, it's a good question, and I just responded, I, I I was ready to shut down my company for two weeks, if need be. Ready to do that, and then just kick it back, you know, back on in two weeks, and so when the shutdown notice went out spent a good 15, 20 minutes researching what essential businesses were, how we were, you know, linked with that. And within, you know, that amount of time we were decided we were open. We were definitely, we could not, could not put any kind of hospital in jeopardy or anything like that. But if, if truly the 14 day incubation period or time that the virus gets out of your system was actually, you know, correct or true or whatever, that should have done it. That should have made a bigger impact. But we should have been. We should have shut everything down. Talking about everything. I mean, we're talking about airports. We're talking about hospitals. And I know that's not a favorable response, but that should have been done. Instead, it pushed people into grocery stores. It pushed people into, you know, into areas concentrated before those stores really truly had an, uh, the ability to make and take steps to ensure social distancing, to put up sneeze guards. So that, that I believe, was a big mistake. Um, number two, after that, I said we should not have shut the economy down completely. We, I truly believe in my heart we could have run the economy, protected everybody at the same time, and then cared for those with with. Uh, health conditions that may have made them more susceptible to COVID-19, pneumonia, flu. We should be doing that anyway, right? We shouldn't have to tell people how to wash your hands or to wash their hands. So I truly believe that we could have done both at the same time because we were kind of doing that. We were kind of doing it at the same time. The steps that we've taken as an essential business we're done from day one, from day two. We were, we had disinfectants, we had wipes, we had everything we needed to disinfect our offices. We put policies into place. High touch surfaces were disinfected uh, twice a day, and make, sometimes even more. And we put all of those steps into place. State had nothing. We did not have anything from them indicating what an essential business had to do. OSHA was still trying to figure stuff out. So was the CDC. So the the reality is 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 the how this whole thing moved forward was just very frustrating leaving many business owners who were essential basically you know left in the lurch trying to figure out how to do the best that they can for their employees to protect them which we do every day we do that every day so that's 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 the frustration that i had and I, and it was good that she that the question was asked to me about what would i have done differently because up until that point i really had never thought about it I just was angry. It's like, this is not working. This is bad. Boom, boom, boom. It was what I'm worried about. But at the same time, you know, they did the best they, that they could based on the information that they had. And when you read information out there, statistics and percentages, so listen to NPR on the way home yesterday. And one of the key points, and maybe, maybe some of you have, 
heard it as well, was the percentages. When you look at percentages, and this is just maybe broke it down very basic for most people, for me, you know, the, the one that needs things explained to me like I'm a kindergartner, and I ask people to do that, like explain it to me like I'm a kindergartner. And this is what they said. So if you lose, okay, if you start off with 10 and you lose 50% of that, it goes down to five. So if somebody reports there was a 50% reduction in this or that, okay, one week on a Friday, okay, so you've lost 50% of 10. The next week, they might say, well, we had a 25% increase, you know, of the five, but they don't talk about, you know, people in theory, or they might think that, well, it's 25% of the total number, which might have been 10, but it wasn't 25% of five, which is 7.5. So, so really, you know, percentages are thrown out there a lot. And if you truly want to dive into those numbers and those statistics, do it, really do it, because there's always ways of looking at the data. I'm not talking about it being manipulated or wrong or different or whatever, but the reality is, is that those numbers, you got to understand where those came from and why they are what they are. And that, that's the only reason, that's the only thing I want to say, because as optimistic or as pessimistic some of those percentages and numbers might be, we really need to look at where, where all those are at. So uh, but that's my response. So maybe you feel differently. Maybe you feel like we should be shut down until we have a virus cure. If we have a, you know, a, uh, uh, a vaccine, I honestly don't think that'll ever happen. Um, and I honestly believe that there are going to be other COVID-19 viruses that spread. I hope not. I hope yeah, I don't want to see anybody die from this. And unfortunately that has actually happened. But, but at the end of the day, the damage to the economy, I have no idea what that's going to do. And looking back, I, I truly hope that we look and learn at what we did with, with this pandemic and we make changes to ensure we don't make some of those same mistakes in the future. That's, that's all I can say. I'm not an expert by any means. And, and by all means, make sure you're keeping your, your family safe, your, yourself safe, wash your freaking hands. I mean, I, nobody should have to tell anybody that. But the reality is there are some people out there that just don't do it. <laughs> anyway, so that's all I got to say about that. But anyway, if um, anybody has any questions, comments, or want to share with that, please uh, uh, let me know. And I, I say Bob Shepard had a great article in The Progress last, um, I'd say, week and a half ago, two weeks, um, which basically said that, you know, if you wear two stopwatches, you're going to get two different, you know, times. They're not going to be exactly. They'll never be. The theory of probability is that they will never, no matter how close you get them to the, you know, on the money, you'll have two different times. So it's all how we look at the data, how we interpret it, and extrapolate the data and, and, and use it to protect people. And, and, and in terms of in Illinois, I just don't believe that the numbers that are being used or were used to make such drastic, drastic decisions was good from the beginning. I just don't believe it. And that that and I'm not talking about conspiracy theories. I'm just talking about what our leading medical expert who has been sharing information who it's specifically said that the numbers that are used to count covid deaths from the state of Illinois and the federal government are based on if you had covid, you died of a car accident, you're treated as a covid death. She said that. Or if you're on hospice and you die and you have COVID-19, you're treated as a COVID-19 death, no matter what. There's no rhyme or reason. In nursing, nursing home facilities, if there are multiple outbreaks of COVID-19, if you die of pneumonia and you're not tested for COVID-19, you are treated as a COVID death in the numbers. And that's what I have a hard time with just in how how those numbers are either used or inflated or whatever. I just believe that if we're going to make such drastic steps that they sh those numbers should be pretty much exact and pretty much on the money and not this 10% off or whatever. So that's my only point, and I'm not throwing conspiracy theories out there, not making this political. My biggest concern, as I have said it from the beginning, is the long-term effects of the economy, the unemployment, and, um, and I, I really truly wish I didn't care, but I do because it is going to affect so many people and so many people's livelihoods and their families and, and what they knew 
that was good and real and, and, and awesome, and that is just going to be gone. And, and I, I just don't think that's going to come back anytime soon. And it's, it's just really easy for uh, so, you know, some of our state politicians that are loaded with money not to have to worry about stuff like that. But there are going to be people hurting all over the country, and I feel for them. Really, I truly do. And that, that just, that just it kills me inside. Okay, that's enough. I got my, uh, that's my uh, <laughs> therapy session. Thank you for listening. All right, we're going to get th- into the news next, and we'll have you out of here uh, in no time. Let this week's news stories give you a lift on what's happening in the vertical transportation arena. Each news segment is organically dug and fresh with news stories of the week. Got lift? If not, stay tuned. Okay, so this week had a qu- quite a few stories relating to COVID-19, elevators in general. Now keep in mind, whenever you're reading things online, please make sure you understand that some of these are re- opinion pieces. Some of these are written by people that are not experts. My comments on them are just my comments. If you don't believe it or you don't, you know, agree with them, I don't care. That's fine. It's not a big deal, you know, but just keep that all in mind that just because it's online, it is not necessarily completely 100% real or normal, and I'm going to get into that in a little bit. So citylab.com has a, uh, a blog post or an article from uh, Laura Bliss talking about elevators change cities. Will coronavirus change elevators? And, yes, I do believe that it will. And it, this is a good article with lots of links in it, okay, throughout the, uh, uh, throughout the article. But if you scroll down, um, if you cr- scroll down, you're going to see a whole bunch of different um, – uh, let's see uh, – whole bunch of different different links and, and sightings and whatnot and i'm just trying to get down here it's an interesting article i think uh laura did a pretty good job what concerned me is that when you when you scroll down and i link these other two articles um in the story below they're talking about cities whether or not you know coronavirus or or transmission of diseases and germs is is based on crowding or density, which, to be honest with you, I I feel like there's really not a a huge difference between that other than the fact that density just might be people close together but but separated and crowding, obviously, is people on top of each other, close to each other. Um, But the articles that she linked in here, let's see here. Oh, gosh. Is going to change the landscape of, of the device that we that we you know love and, and have loved for so long. It's going to change how people how buildings open and um, and it's not just elevators. It's stairways. It's going to be doorknobs. It's going to be a whole bunch of different things. So one of the articles that uh, is cited in here is what is called in the article a rough you know quote end quote rough estimate or theoretical hypothetical elevator scenarios based on asymptomatic infected individual traveling 10 stories in a residential building with an empty return uh, to the first floor. And so while this Dr. Richard Corsi is, uh, I guess, a doctor, according to Twitter, or according to his handle, uh, reality is that um, the data, there's no, you know, there's no information that's, um, there's no information that cites whether or not this information is, is correct necessarily. And the reality is, is even he in this article says the following, admittedly high un, highly uncertainty here, uh, but a single hypothetical scenario does suggest that elevator cabin air may remain infectious for trips beyond infector exit. So, okay, remember, people, when they read that, rarely do they say admittedly high uncertainty here. You know, so, I mean, so we're, we're talking about admitting that the information you have may not be correct, but yet... It may be, you know, it, but people, when they listen to stuff like that, they'd listen to literally the, uh, they'd listen to the part that they want to hear, unfortunately. Next news article, an uneven curve flattening with Manhattan ahead of the Bronx. Uh, again, you know, we're talking about trying to minimize the spread of the virus or germs, and that makes it extremely difficult when you have states like Illinois that are locked down for for a, for a long time, and then Wisconsin is, is somewhat open, but not really open on a, on a normal basis. How do you how do you prevent interstate travel that would prevent the spread of the virus? It seems like an insurmountable task to attempt to do so, and it just boggles my mind that you know 
the, the steps we've taken actually have done what you know have done something I, I don't know I hope they have I truly hope they have uh, but this information on that and the curve flatting what you're comparing different counties you know what I mean like even breaking it down to cities and counties how it's extremely difficult to really I don't know try to try to track that and um, uh, compare it based on invisible county lines or, or city lines in the wonderful world of semantics um, let's see here what was I I forgot why I related this one as an article just because you can afford to leave the city doesn't mean you should and this talks about the density and and um, so some statistics again I'm, I'm getting back to how they're going to try to get people to stay in the city to some extent, but uh, they talk about life expectancy of New Yorkers uh, roughly 2.5 years longer than the nation in 2017. Again, that's a number that's ridiculous. I mean, it's, 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 so, anyway. Again, talking about density compared to crowding. Be honest with you, I think cities are going to see a mass exodus if people can move. They will, it will happen. I really, people do not want to take the transit. People do not want to take, uh, they do not want to be in conditions like that, just, just out of fear for, for obvious reasons, the fear that we love and live in today. Okay, another news article, this one from uh, Biz Now, but there were a few other ones that um, also talked about that. Sinking feeling elevators could thwart office reentry. So this... I think this looks like it may be a info type um, info type type product uh, like blog posts, but I'm not 100 percent sure. But this is tying into the fact that uh, you know the number of people that ride an elevator is going to change uh, quickly. Talking about people riding, you know, in the corners on on stickers on the floor. This is good pro this is a good time for sticker makers. Uh, so it's just that's a little scary. Uh, next article here is that, and, and what's even more concer considering concerning, I think, is is as offices reopen, they're not going to have cafeterias uh, for people to eat in. So if there's not enough space for those, and that's and that's concerning too, because OSHA requires. Um, that you not eat at your desk or your workstation. You have to have provide a clean environment for that to happen. So it becomes kind of an issue where we are so concerned about one thing that we, what do we drop our guard on the others? You know what I mean? It's like it's like what is the worse worser of two evils? You know, we're not supposed to use gloves on uh, you know using machinery, uh, equipment that spins stuff like that for fear of being pulled into it. But yet you know we will be a a, a glove filled society. So it becomes, you know, it's it's going to be, I, I feel like we're going to go so far to one side of the ship where it's going to sh it's going to sink and then we're going to have all these other issues that will be out of balance because we have jumped the fence. I'm using so many different anal analogies that make no sense whatsoever. <laughs> but I feel like we're, we're focusing just on one thing to where the other things are just going to skyrocket in, in how, you know, fatalities and injuries in the workplace are going to occur. And it's, it's difficult to do that when things just go so fast, so fast, so fast. So we'll see what happens. Uh, state guidelines in Texas to limit elevator capacity due to COVID-19. It's the first state to have done this, and I don't think necessarily should be something that, that any state should mandate. Uh, I think this should be up to possibly the building owner. If um, There's obviously some guidelines in here for putting stickers in the corners for people to stand in. Uh, there's some facilities and some hospitals that are only allowing one person to ride in an elevator at one time. But at the same time, if you have a mask on, why not ride with more people? Because the mask prevents you from giving the virus to somebody else. So at what point are we really like getting ahead with this? If you don't want to ride an elevator, just wait for the next one. So there will be an increase in, in, in how we disinfect elevators. There will be in, in terms of products, in terms of destination dispatch systems will, will increase in how buildings are upgraded so at some point i'm curious to see when does that when do we shift you know flick the switch back to the normal where we go yeah remember that pandemic we had yeah we were crazy back then but maybe it won't be like that maybe we'll this will be the new norm which i would hate for it to be but maybe that's the way it will be if you are in texas and you're interested in finding out exactly what those types of state um minimum standard health protocols are you can i got the pdf linked in here but just give you an idea of what some of the 
protocols that employees and contractors should be put through, train all employees and contractors on appropriate cleaning, disinfectant, hand hygiene, respiratory etiquette. CDC has something on that. I think the uh, Department of Labor as well. Uh, that's a given. We had done that. Basically, we had done that before this pandemic. I mean, it's, you know, it, and then the next one, screen employees and contractors be coming into the office. So I'm supposed to I'm supposed to ask every employee, hey, can you, do you have a cough? Do you have shortness of breath? I'm like, I mean, geez, half of this stuff I feel like every day. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like and then once you do ask them, you're not supposed to share that information with anybody. That's private information. So at what point do you truly have as an employee, you know, the right to no Im- health information about your your uh, your em- employees. So a lot of this is all common sense. Again, I just wish we had a little more common sense and didn't need a, a three place, you know, three page, uh, um, a three page document that outlines this. I mean, any business that is in business should not need this document to figure out what they need to do to keep their employees sane. (laughs) But maybe some do. Next news article, getting ready to open up uh, workplaces. This doesn't affect our industry, but guidance on preparing workplaces for COVID-19. This is an OSHA document. And again, this one one that was uh, produced a while ago. So... And it does go into some of the information. Obviously, I, I imagine this will probably up, be updated or changed in the future. And let's see here. Going to go to the next one. Uh, consequences of the shutdown. I, you know, and, and this is my biggest fear. As uh, and again, this is not a website that is legitimate whatsoever in terms of I've heard, have I heard it before. But and I'm not even going to get into what this guy had actually written about, but the reality is COVID-19 is deadly, and so is keeping millions of people out of work. There are definite, larger, significant issues relating to the economy being shut down that we have not even begun to realize or comprehend. And that day when we do, it will be way too late. And that's that's really that's the moral of this this article. And I, I didn't read it, okay? I don't need to read it because everybody has their own perspective on it. But the reality is, is that once we get to the point when we look back, I just hope that the next time we go through this, or something comes up, we handle it a little bit better, and we don't scare the crud out of everybody about it. Um, and that's just that's a frustration that I see. So, anyway, well, that's going to do it for today's show, everybody. It's a short week, but it will probably feel like a long week because that just seems to be the way it happens. So, uh, be safe out there. Keep your family safe and uh, just hang in there. Uh, there will be a day when we do not need to do Zoom conferences anymore and all that stuff. We'll be able to hug our, our parents, which I do anyway. But I'm just saying, you know, when you have a being told over and over again not to hug people and not to uh, touch people, it's uh, just just drives you kind of crazy. It leaves me to, to some extent, and uh, um, I'm not worried like that. As much of a uh, introvert as I am, I'm not wired not to uh, give somebody a hug or uh, appreciate appreciate them and, and feel like they have the plague. I'm not, I don't want to be like that. I want to, I want to think most people have the goodness in them that, uh, that I do. And, uh, reciprocating that is, is important to me. So anyway, so have a great rest of the week. Be safe. We'll talk to you next Wednesday. Bye-bye.